Hey everybody, today we're going to talk about fame or faithfulness. Which race are you running? Well, years ago when my son Jake was young, he played soccer and in the soccer league he was in, sometimes you would go to these big parks and there would be multiple, multiple games all going on at the same time. And so I was looking for him. I got there late and I ended up watching this one game for a while and I realized that Jake was not in this game. This was not his team. This was not the field. In fact, it wasn't even the right park. It was in a game on a field with a team across the street. And in that moment, I felt like God said to me, Tommy, this is like you. You're at the wrong park on the wrong field playing the wrong game. <laughs> You're playing the game or running the race of trying to find fame for yourself instead of running the race and playing the game of winning glory for me and living a life of faithfulness for my sake. And as you can imagine, I was like, oh God, please forgive me. And you know, we live in a culture that more than ever celebrates and values fame. And now with social media, everybody can be a little famous. Unfortunately, um, we can get into comparing our fame. So if you're a second grader in your school class and you want to be popular, or if you're a world famous celebrity, everyone's clutching for fame. And isn't it ironic that worship leaders now can be rich and famous? I mean, really rich and famous. And yet it's crazy because the very essence of what a worship leader exists to do is to give worth and glory and honor to God, to the only one who deserves it, and inspire everyone they are leading to do the same, to deflect the glory off of them onto God. And yet, we're constantly tempted in an unhealthy way to receive the glory for ourselves. So sin number one, really, <laughs> is stealing God's glory away. That's the story of Lucifer. He was an angel of light. He was beautiful. God created him to magnify and glorify God. But he wanted to be God's equal. And he wanted people to worship him. So as the story got, goes, it didn't go well for him. And God sends him to the abyss and to the pit. And um, the reason I tell that story is it's kind of interesting that as people in any kind of public ministry and um, people that other people are looking up to, I think we have even a greater, possibly, a greater temptation towards the Lucifer story to make people look at us and, and admire us. And it's a scary thought, but that's why I want to talk about this. Um, and, and if that's sin number one, then sin number two, I think, would be manipulation. And a great example for manipulation is the story of Abraham and Sarah. So God, I mean, check out this verse, uh, Genesis 12, 2. It says, God says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great. Basically, God tells Abraham, look, I'm going to make you famous, like really famous. So he's like, awesome. I always wanted to be famous. No, whatever. But then Sarah can't conceive a son. Problem. So they're like, okay, obviously God needs a little bit of help here with the plan. So, and how many of us have ever thought, God, your timing's not really working out like the way I'm thinking it should, so I'm going to help you out. And we start manipulating. So they come up with a plan. Abraham sleeps with Hagar, the maidservant, and the maidservant conceives um, Ishmael. And then the next thing you know, uh, Sarah resents Hagar. There's all kind of family drama and all kinds of trouble follows after that. And let me tell you, I can tell you in my own life, whenever we start forcing and striving and manipulating so that God will 
bring all our dreams to come true and so that more people will admire us. It, only, it doesn't only destroy our lives, but it leaves a, ta- a, a trail of destruction behind us. So, the big question of the day is, how can I get off the fame playing field and onto the faithfulness playing field? So here's, a, here's actually seven points, seven things that have helped me along the way, continue to help me because I'm still on this journey, to learn how to give God glory and take it off of myself. Number one, learn how to love God's glory. And the way you do that, and this is really simple, is to worship God, to authentically, passionately, with all your focus and gaze upon Him, worship Him. I mean, I have had the privilege of leading worship at some really big events in a lot of places in the world, and I've had a lot of people come up to me after a concert and give me some flattering words, and while those words were encouraging, I also know the difference between that And when God has met me in a deep and authentic way through a time of worship where I've sensed his presence. And it's actually been something that's comforted me a lot because I can become so uh, just grieved by how wicked my own heart is. But I can tell myself honestly, and I can tell you, I love and long for God's genuine presence more than I long for flattering words. Because when you've tasted of the true goodness of God and His presence and felt the weight of His glory on your life, there is nothing that can compare. So the more you do that and you go to that secret place and you learn to worship Him, the more you'll love His glory and the more you'll love Him and and, uh, magnifying Him more than yourself. Take my word for it. It's step number one. Number two, start serving now. I remember my mom telling me long time ago when I was just learning to play guitar and really just saved. She said, don't wait for the perfect situation and for all everything, all the stars to line up just right for you to begin serving God. Start serving Him right now. Start giving your life away in this moment. And I'll never forget walking with Mark Pickrell, my pastor, when I first came to the church. He said, Tommy, you wouldn't believe what God could do if we could just get people to show up and serve. And in that moment, I thought to myself, I'm going to be one of those guys. When he calls and says, Tommy, will you do this? Will you serve this way? I'm going to be one of the guys that shows up. I'm going to be there on time and I'm going to serve. I haven't done that perfectly, but that's been my goal. And, and so the other thing, the reason why this kind of doesn't happen sometimes is because we have this thought in our mind, when I get the big, big opportunity, the big stuff, that's when God is going to really use me in a powerful way. I mean, when I get to lead for that really huge church or sign a record contract or have millions of followers, what it is, whatever it is, that's when God's going to use me. But that's not God's economy. You have to trust me with this. God's economy and God's numbers are very different. Uh, I have found that when we serve God in the simplest ways, the humblest ways, some of the greatest fruit that will ever come out of our life, the most lasting fruit that will ever come out of our lives is in those humble, simple situations. And the truth is, it's also the accumulative effect of all of us as the body of Christ just serving and doing our part. That's how God does amazing things on this earth. So, get moving. Start serving. Number three, have a vision. Every time I go and visit my dad, who's now 94 years old, he always asks me, Tommy, 
what's your vision for the future? And the reason he asks me that is because he knows without a vision, the people perish. And he knows if I don't know where I'm headed, if I don't know how it is that God uniquely wants to work through my life, I'll live an aimless life and I'll eventually, honestly, give up. When I received Christ in the middle of a worship service and sensed his presence for the first time, I really simultaneously sensed the call of God on my life. And um, right at that same time is when I discovered worship and I discovered playing guitar and all those things. And, and I just had, I felt like a real direction in my life that God was going to use me. It, it wasn't completely clear, but it was becoming very clear. It was going to be through music and songwriting and, and these different things. So because of that, even though I've done it so very imperfectly, I've been able to walk a little more directly towards the things that God has called me to. And I've been able to say no to a lot of good things, but things that would have got me off track, things that would have sidetracked me to the left or to the right and kept me from my, my uh, most important purposes. And so that's why having a vision is so important. I encourage you to Go before the Lord and, and ask the Lord and ask people that love you, people that know Him, know God in a deep way and say, what do you think my top gifts are? What, what do you see me doing for the kingdom of God in the most effective way? When God is using me and the anointing is there and it's powerful, tell me, what does that look like? A lot of times we have such wrong ideas of who we are and how God uses us and the people in our lives that love us. That's why it's so important to live in community will help us and tell us and guide us. So important. Number four, keep growing. No matter how old you are or how young you are, keep learning new things. Keep growing. Um, I, in my life, I keep growing. I've told the story before. I, not long ago, I took up the chromatic harmonica because it's actually kind of a different difficult instrument to learn, but I've always, uh, I've always loved it. I love uh, Stevie Wonder's harmonica playing and Toots Thelman and some of these guys. It's just such a soulful instrument. So I thought, I'm an old guy, but I'm going to keep learning new things. I've been learning how to play with a thumb pick, which is a different kind of pick. Just continuing to grow. That's my desire. And here's one of the reasons why. When I keep growing, and, and also growing in, in my, um, my knowledge of, of the Bible and theology and all these things, when I'm pushing forward and growing, it helps me stay off of the whole comparison game. I mean, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I'm telling you, we've never... Here's the pandemic of the world right now, is comparison. We have all this social media and everything, and now, it used to be that you had to try to not compare yourself to your neighbors or to your family members or your friend next door or people at church. But now you can compare yourself to everybody online and everybody on social media. And I mean, sometimes I'll see these young guys playing guitar on YouTube or whatever, and they're 10,000 times better than me. I'm like, ah, oh, I'm just going to give up. I'm no good. <laughs> or whatever it is. Comparison is the death of creativity. It's the death of going forward and trying new things and, and uh, risking things for the kingdom of God. God has made you in a unique way and he wants to use you in new, unique ways. And he does not want you to compare. Compare, I'm telling you, it's a trick of the enemy. But when I'm focusing on growing in my gifts and serving, my mind tends to go off comparison and it helps me so much. And guess what? At the same time, it's preparing you for those open doors that God has for you in your future. So keep growing. Keep learning. Number five, be tenacious. A faithful servant has a determination and a grit to accomplish all the things that God has for them in their life on this planet. Uh, the first person that comes to my mind is my brother Dale, who 
is a missionary pastor in New Mexico. I mean, you just have this sense on him that he's not going to leave any, any rock unturned. Anything that God has, has preordained for him to do and accomplish in his life, he's going to make it happen. He's going to do it. He's not going to waste his time, you know. And Jesus said in this world, you will have tribulation, you will have trouble, you will have obstacles, but the only way to live a meaningful life is to be a person who overcomes those obstacles and overcomes those hardships. And not only that, you want to be, listen to this, you want to be a finisher. You want to be a person who, when they start something, they don't quit, but they finish. And even if you're currently working on something and it's starting to feel like a waste of time, just the finishing of that thing you started is going to grow you so that you can learn to finish the important things later. Being a finisher, being a tenacious person, knowing God has preordained works for me to accomplish on this earth and I am going to do it. That's what you want to do. That's what you want to be. Be tenacious. Number six, be accountable. Have people in your life that will give you permission to tell you when you're stealing away the glory. This is super humiliating, super painful, really hard to do, but so life-giving, so God-glorifying, and you will end up living with so much hope so much more wholeness and joy in your life if you'll have people that will tell you when you're doing it. And just the fact that you know you have people that love you that are watching out for this is going to help you not go there as often. I mean, accountability in every area of our life is always a good thing. That's one of the great things about marriage is we grow because we're accountable to our spouses in so many ways. Number seven, and this is my last point, look forward to your reward in heaven. I mean, live for heaven. It's a strange thing, but the best way, way to be effective in this life is to have your heart set on the next. If the rewards of this life mean less to you, you're not going to have as big a need to take credit for everything. And being a person that's constantly trying to take the credit for everything is an exhausting life to live. In other words, live your life for those words that we all long to hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. As I grow older, I'm becoming so, so aware of how short life is, how limited my time is, how I want to make every day count. And, and something I've learned in, in, in being faithful is just try to accomplish at least one thing every day. And even if it's just one thing that's going to help you accomplish the next faithful, God-glorifying act, that God-glorifying act that is living out your unique calling. Uh, be sure you accomplish one thing, because we can just become overwhelmed. Oh, I don't know how to do it. I can't do it. Uh, just what can you do today to accomplish that one thing? So in conclusion, let's keep fighting to find our fulfillment in our significance, in God's glory, not in our glory. Like I've said before, unfortunately, until we see Jesus, this is a fight we're going to have to keep fighting. But it's a fight that's worth fighting. Remember, it's our job to be faithful. It's God's job to bring the blessing. We bring preparation and hard work, and He brings opportunities and good fruit. Every time I've stopped trying to help God fulfill my dreams and just been serving Him and growing in Him, God has blessed me in wondrous ways. 
I've now been here at my church, Christian Assembly, this is amazing, but for over 30 years, by God's amazing grace and by these amazing, generous people that have surrounded me. But I've learned that it's less about making a big splash at a moment in time and more about living a lifetime of small, faithful acts of service. The accumulation of these acts will add up to bring fruit that is much more lasting and far more God-glorifying. Take it from an old guy that's been around and has tried and tried to be the big splash guy, but has found how it's the accumulative, simple, humble acts of service that God adds up for a lot of meaningful, lasting fruit in a life. And I'll leave you with this. When you're driving home from one of those Sundays when you led worship at church or whatever it was, wherever it was you were serving, and everything went wrong. All the technical things went wrong. You sang out a key, you broke a string, you forgot the lyrics, you whatever. You embarrassed yourself in some way. Whatever, everything, it just wasn't a good day. And you're hearing this voice just saying, why don't you give up? Uh, who do you think you are? You, you, you shouldn't have never been up there doing that to begin with. Don't do this anymore. That's the voice of the enemy. And sometimes it's the voice of scoffing people around you. And I just want you to know, if you just keep showing up, you can say to them, you know, you might be right. I might not be the most gifted person. But today, I was faithful. If you can say those words, you can know that you will and are hearing God's words. Great job, good and faithful servant. I hope this has been a blessing. It is my honor to be on mission in this great kingdom of God with you. And to God be all the glory. I hope this has been helpful. And uh, I hope to meet you someday here or there or in the air, as we say. God bless.